Hey nerds, Farmer Jesse here. Now, if you've been watching this channel for any amount of time, you know I experiment just a little bit in the garden. And I talk about those experiments in these videos, but I don't always get a chance to fully follow up on them. So today I'm going to talk about things like how the static aerated compost system is going, how the chamomile in the pathways turned out. Uh, remember the double seeding thing from the interplanting video? Yeah, got some things to discuss. So let's do it. So even though there are some fascinating findings in many of my weird trials, most of them don't necessitate their own videos, but I also don't like leaving you hanging because the whole point of my trials is to do the weird stuff so you don't have to. Where to start is difficult, but I'll start with one that I have not updated anyone on in any other video, which is the interplanting trial I discussed in this video here, where I was sowing lettuce and cilantro together in the same block. As the story goes, a couple years back, we accidentally seeded the same blocks with lettuce and fennel because unpelleted lettuce seeds are sneaky little guys. However, instead of throwing the blocks in the compost and starting over, and because we're nerds, we decided to go ahead and plant them and see what happens. Well, to our delight, we were able to get heads of lettuce and then two weeks later, bulbs of fennel. Now, neither were the largest versions of either crop, but I was encouraged to play around with the idea because whatever you can do in the greenhouse, like seeding two crops together, saves you time in the field. Uh, that said, I don't need much fennel for our market, so that combo wasn't super helpful. So this year, we started trialing cilantro and dill and lettuce together, because I can sell a boatload of each in the summer, literally putting both the seeds inside the same block at the same time. And, well, the results were underwhelming. The cilantro tended to outcompete the lettuce, and the lettuce never really sized up very well, it was just wildly inconsistent, uh, especially for a production farm. That said, one nice thing we learned was that cilantro and dill, which notoriously bolt early, grew quite well in our summer lettuce routine, which you can learn about in the Living Soil Handbook along with several other crops, if you're interested in how we do those in an ecological, no-till-y kind of way. Uh, pick that up at notillgrowers.com to support our work. Anyway, we started planting cilantro and dill around our lettuces instead of in the same block and got great yields on both all summer. Uh, now we just need more dill fans. Those are my people. Folks have asked about our drainage issues that I discussed the first year on this property and there have been some mixed results. Uh, half of the beds with poor drainage that are at the top of the hill are doing significantly better just from good soil practices. The other half were, well, kind of hopeless. Uh, well, that's not entirely true. They improved quite a bit, honestly, but just not enough to rely on for production for the next few years, and even then, if they really improved, I would still have my doubts in a really wet year that effectively anything would grow. I mean, you can see the wetness in drone shots. That's not great, it's kind of wild. So rather than fighting that year after year, this fall we took half of that plot entirely out of production and turned all the beds straight downhill. Now I've avoided turning beds downhill because I don't like the erosion potential, but with the living pathways, I don't worry about that quite as much as I used to. Um, hopefully that will help them drain better. I, I should have done that to begin with, honestly, but I like learning the hard way, apparently. That, and I wanted to see how uh, effective are methods of soil improvement that I always talk about, like using cover crops and raised beds and all these things, would be in that scenario. For most of that plot, it went great, and the whole plot improved, but just not enough to achieve robust photosynthesis. So yeah, that's where we're at on that. Tomato grafting? That was also something that we played with quite a bit this year in the spring, um, as I described in this video. And we learned some interesting things, uh, though it was a weird year to try and be learning anything, specifically because the smoke from the Canada fires landed right on top of us down here in Kentucky, and basically everything was two or more weeks behind, including our tunnel tomatoes. Then, for whatever reason, the tomatoes just did not perform well. Specifically, we saw early blight fairly early, if that's not too redundant of an observation, and we started to see the tomatoes go down. Well, the ungrafted tomatoes go down. Now, grafting is not supposed to impart leaf blight resistance to the scion, but we lost almost every one of our ungrafted plants by September while the grafted plants were still going. 
Because we lost so many ungrafted plants, measuring yield was kind of difficult, but overall, in those first few harvests at least, there was a considerable difference. The grafted were earlier to harvest, more robust and more vigorous overall. If we had not grafted any plants, it would have been a terrible cherry tomato year, which is not great because that's a huge crop for us. So in terms of whether or not it was worth it, duh, yeah, like 100% worth it. That tunnel bed needs some TLC, obviously, and that loss from blight in the tunnel was massively disappointing. But I certainly feel like grafting was the right choice there, and I'm glad we did it. I will continue those trials in 2024. I suspect that the issue with the bed was that I was trying to use leaf mold compost that was just not entirely decomposed well enough. And when you couple that with compaction in that area that we've been fighting because it used to house horses, like literally there was a horse stable there. Um, so anyway, when you couple it with that compaction in that area in the cool, smoky spring, they just did not perform as I'd hoped. Next, I started playing with chamomile in the pathways a couple years back. Uh, for context, we maintain plants between our growing beds, which we call living pathways, uh, meaning the space between our beds is in a mixture of grasses and clovers and various other weeds and plants, etc. And we've done loads of videos on that. In the past, we've tried sowing different pathway crops uh, there intentionally, but in our climate, we just have too long of a season for that to really work. By the time summer is in full swing, nothing can keep the weeds suppressed for that long. But I wanted to give chamomile a try because I'd heard growers having some success and so I gave it a shot. And honestly, it just never really took off. To be clear, I used Roman chamomile and not common chamomile, which grows far too tall. Roman is the creeping variety. Uh, I sowed it in the fall and the germination was actually really good, just tossing it on the ground, but it was just too slow to establish in the spring and never really got going that well. You can kind of see it in a few of the photos, but ultimately it got overtaken fast enough that I was unable to really get much footage at all of it. And then by mid spring, it had started to be overtaken by other plants in the pathways. Um, that said, where it was established was the greatest smelling experience of all time. I now sow Roman chamomile in our paths in the fall with the white clover that we sow just, you know, to have a few nice whiffs of chamomile while we're harvesting. It calms me down a little bit, which is probably a good thing. Speaking of common chamomile though, we did take the worst bed out of production this year in our poorly draining plot that I would basically consider unusable and sowed that to the common chamomile. Amazingly, the common chamomile was up for the task and grew luxuriously with big, beautiful white flowers loaded with insects. Unfortunately, I mostly wasted the flowers because I was not prepared for anything to succeed in that bed. So if this is a studs and duds video, I am the dud in this scenario. Speaking of studs and duds, in fact, uh, let's talk about some tool revelations in 2023. The Swift Blocker was great. We started with that tool early in the season and finished out with the 200 block Swift Blocker for lettuce and cilantro and all the way through. The 72 block had a few issues with bending and I lost several of the dibblers, but I think they are working on both of those issues and otherwise I still really like those blockers. Um, a tool I didn't really love this year was the hose reel from Hoselink, this thing right here. Technically it was fine, like it worked. I really like the quick detaching element and would happily have something like that on all of my hoses, but the reel was just a little too slow for me. Uh, by the middle of whatever month I installed it, I just wound up leaving it on the ground, leaving the hose just kind of on the ground, which was kind of the reason for getting a hose reel to begin with, was to keep it up. In a backyard situation or a non-production situation, this probably makes some sense, but it was just too time consuming for me to get the hose back in the reel uh, and the constant back tension made it awkward. So not exactly a dud, but a definite didn't fit my system tool. Otherwise, I didn't try that many more tools this year, weirdly. Uh, my style of market gardening just doesn't really require a whole heck of a lot of, you know, of tools to pull it off. I still have plans to change the root washing station up a bit and add a hose for bin washing. So there may be a little bit more of that next year's update video, or maybe the one in 2028. We'll have to wait and see. I did play around a little bit with uh, mulching with rotten wood chips these last two years to okay results. Uh, fresh wood chips, I would not use as a mulch. I just do not recommend it. But partially decomposed wood chips do have some potential, I find. You cannot work these into the soil still in the same way you can't work in fresh wood chips. But so long as they have been sitting around, the wood chips have been sitting around for a reasonable amount of time with moisture. For the last year or so, I saw no ill effects of using them as a mulch. 
more experiments should be done in that regard, but it could help with my lack of composting mulch to have those rotten wood chips as an option, and especially as an option I can trust. Uh, the issue with using fresh wood chips on the bed surface is both nitrogen tie-up and potentially leaching from the chips. If you intend to do that, put a boatload of compost below the chips first. Yes, they will only tie up nitrogen where they are touching, but combined with the leaching element of things like tannins in the wood chips and the cooling effect of lightly colored mulches, they will likely arrest or stunt your growth considerably. I mean, your plant's growth. You know what I mean? It's not coffee or cigarettes or American cheese or whatever. Wood chips will just limit the plant's productivity and require you to space everything out quite a bit more. Now, the one weird trial I think that everyone wants an update on is the static aerated compost system uh, that I talk about in this video. How do I feel now after two seasons with this thing? And the answer is, nah. Here's the thing. The value of the static aerated compost pile is that it makes organic compliant compost very quickly. So if you have a manure source and you want to make compost, you can do it this way in a way that is accepted by organic certifiers in just a few days with no turning in a static aerated compost system. By contrast, you have to turn that same pile five times in a 15 day period if not static aerated, which indeed makes basically zero sense. But them's the rules and the static aerated system does not make particularly great compost and the compost should be turned anyway to better mix and distribute temperatures and materials. But what it does is that it puts the turning process much more on my terms, meaning that I can turn it whenever the heck I have time to turn it instead of five times in a 15 day period and still consider it usable immediately for organic certification. Look up the 9120 day rule and NOP regulations to better understand the regulations that I'm having to deal with for organic production and FISMA, which probably just sounds like a bunch of jargony gibberish if you're not a farmer. But all of that is really relevant if you're doing production agriculture in terms of selling fresh produce. Anyway, if I missed anything that you've been wondering about from our farm from these videos, let me know. Otherwise, this will be my last video until like February-ish, that way I can get prepped for the next season and get to researching for the next year's videos. Otherwise, like this video if you like this video. If you are not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Also, if you enjoy these videos and they bring you actual value, you can support them by buying a copy of the Living Soil Handbook from notillgrowers.com or a hat or other merch where the proceeds go to making you more videos like this. Join our Patreon page at patreon.com slash no-till growers or just hit that super thanks button. That works too. Also, special request this week, Jackson's farm and almost exclusively his farm got hit by a tornado. So if you have a few extra bucks, go to his GoFundMe page. I will link that in the show notes. Otherwise, we'll see you all next year. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. I see you. Bye. You just, it, you just can't, you just can't make it through one video. Am I even in focus?